Alhamdulillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassili amri wa hlul uqbata min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to the Qarween podcast. We know it's been a while. Um, this is your host Sara and I'm here today with my lovely co-host Aisha H. How have you been Aisha? Alhamdulillah Sara, how are you? I'm doing well, alhamdulillah. It's been ages, um, not between us, <laughs> but yeah. for the podcast, we haven't yeah, recorded yeah. in a long time. <laughs> um, how does it feel to be back? It feels strange, to be honest. Um, I mean, I'm glad that, alhamdulillah, we're back and we're doing it. Uh, we've it, It's been also good to like take a break, though. I think sometimes all of us just, alhamdulillah, have a lot going on in our lives. And sometimes we just need to take a step back and recalibrate. And also then just bring I think fresh eyes to inshallah like new conversations and yeah it's it, it's been a good break but I'm looking forward to starting back up again as well likewise alhamdulillah yeah people have asked and I'm sure many more people have many more people have been wondering where we've been um and it's been a like a combination of things one is just that the the team has gotten busy um but also I think we needed some time to just reevaluate what the Qadween project is and what its mission is and how we want to go about this work and so I think people will maybe start to see a shift in like the tone that we take towards the content that we put out, inshallah. But um, what they can expect, bi'ithnillah, is um, a continued focus on um, the affairs of the ummah, continued focus on empowering Muslim women to be involved in these things, to be thinking and talking and learning about them, inshallah. Um, inshallah. But I think we're going to lean more into our niche, bi'ithnillah. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and one other thing that we wanted to mention is that this, inshallah, is going to be, I believe, episode 27. Uh, prior to this, before we had gone on hiatus, we had recorded an episode about Syria, about the revolution, about the past um, decade, slightly over a decade. And um, that episode did not come out, not because there was anything wrong with it, but again, in addition to the staff getting busy, once, event, once basically post-October 7th, we felt like we should start, if when we come back, we should come back with an episode for Islam Palestine. Um, but inshallah, that episode on Syria will be released uh, soon after this one. That's the plan, inshallah. So that leads us into the topic of today's episode, which is current events in Palestine and specifically in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip. And there's not much of a an intro that we can lead into besides, you know, just getting right into the topic. So I want to start by asking you, Aisha, it has been a difficult five months for, for all of us, for the entire ummah. So can you start by just letting us know how have you felt in these past few months since you've been witnessing these events? I mean, it's it's like you said, Sarah, that, you know, no intro is needed. And I think at this point, words are failing all of us to describe what has been a surreal and seemingly unending uh, months where all of us, m- months of pain where all of us have been witnessing a genocide. And I know for the I can speak at least for myself and other sisters that I've spoken to that the pain of witnessing that has only been interrupted by the guilt at realizing that we're only watching this this horror unfold. We're not actually experiencing it. What right do we have to feel like we are suffering when, you know, it's not actually touching us in any material way? And just sort of wrestling with those emotions all the while this is unfolding on our screens, I think it's been incredibly hard for everybody I know to deal with. Um, On top of that, personally, as someone who has worked a lot on the Palestinian cause um, for a long time, uh, sort of within activism, but also as a journalist, I think the first few months were really characterised by disbelief because I never thought that I would be witnessing another Nakba in in my lifetime that I would be seeing the level of destruction uh, and devastation wrecked upon the Palestinian people with the incredible like long-term consequences that it's it's going to have you know even if we get a ceasefire tomorrow which obviously we all pray inshallah we do I think just sort of that realization settling in was something really overwhelming within the past few months as well that I just you know, I never thought that this would, we, we, that we would see this. And then, of course, you know, obviously everybody listening is already familiar with the extreme level of savagery, barbarism, and just pure malice that we've seen Israel perpetrate against the Palestinians. And 
you know, these things have obviously been happening for a very long time, not necessarily in this current assault on Gaza is not, like, unique, whether it's in previous assaults or it's in the way in which Palestinians have been treated in the West Bank. But, you know, this used to be sort of wrapped up in obscure uh, human rights reports by NGOs like B'Tselem or Adamir. And now we have this information being shared by Israeli soldiers themselves on social media, and the entire world is seeing this. And yet, here we are recording this episode, you know, days before Ramadan, and none of that awareness or evidence has actually counted for anything in being able to stop what we've been seeing over the past five months. Um, yeah, but what, what what about you? I'm I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I mean, I would echo everything you said. I think you you worded very well, like how a lot of us have been feeling. Those of us who are obviously outside of not just Palestine, but even outside of the Muslim world, what it feels like to not to not to just be far away, but specifically as an American, also like being in the belly of the beast. And just this hyper awareness of this of this feeling that we've had for a long time, which is that our existence here is contingent on us being able to benefit the Ummah more than we harm it. And now it's that all that has just been that all of that has been brought into question in like a much more lucid way where it's like, are we really benefiting the Ummah more than harming it by being here? Are we benefiting ourselves and our families and our communities spiritually so much to, you know, to almost like make up for, even though there really is no making up for um, things like paying taxes to this government or working for companies and organizations that in one way or another have ties to Israel, have ties to the Zionist li- lobby or just to Zionist individuals. So that is, yeah, well, obviously I don't like mention any of these things to like garner pity <laughs> as an American, which is it's the last thing that we need or deserve. Um, but just to to express that that has been what, what is on my mind and on the mind of a lot of my my friends and my family who are here as well. But I think what stood out to me the most in the past few months has just been how many facades and pretenses that Muslims have been living under have just been violently torn away. One, it has, you know, what, what I think one of the major things that has been exposed is just the hypocrisy of people, especially Muslims, who are either too afraid to speak about about Palestine in an explicit way, who give these very like mild both side statements, um, or even worse, who are outright supporting people and organizations and governments that are supporting Israel in its genocide. Um, and that is something that like we've been aware of, but I think now it just has been brought to the forefront much more explicitly. Um, so in a sense that has been that, like progress has been made on that front. I think a lot more people, there's way less plausible, den- plausible deniability for the people who are making excuses for that kind of behavior and those kinds of people. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And also, I think one of the things that has happened is I feel like the, and this is something I'm, I'm still thinking over. I feel like the events of the past few months have given credence to that clash of civilizations narrative. And not in the sense that it was articulated by Huntington, but more so how it was articulated by people like Sayyid Naqib al-Attas, who actually spoke about this kind of thing before Huntington and other people as well. But really what I'm talking about is this understanding of of the ummah as distinct, as standing in staunch opposition to kufr and to secularism. And especially to me, it, it just really has emphasized how our closest and our truest allies are really only the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are the only people that we have ultimate loyalty to and we only have loyalty to, loyalty to them for the sake of Allah. Mm. Um, and so that has really stood out to me. And I think I'm really grateful that Ramadan is coming up now because I've just been in a really low place. Like I, I lost the ability to just carry up daily functions at some point. And it, I think, yeah, focusing on following the news, um, which I don't regret. And I'm not saying that I, I shouldn't do that, but it just like altered my day to day. And it put me in in kind of a rut where I like I lost the ability to just like continue doing things that I needed to do when I needed to do them. And but I'm ta- mentioning this because I was I was talking to my dad and I, we were just talking about like how useless the surrounding Muslim states have been, uh, how useless a lot of Muslims have been. And I made this comment where I was like, um, in Ramadan, Muslims are going to be even lazier and more useless, you know, because like. They're all going to be fasting uh, and sleepy and everything. Um, and my dad, very insightfully, like he corrected me and he said that actually historically, 
Ramadan has been a time when Muslims had more himma, when they had more mm-hmm. motivation, more strength, and more tawfiq from Allah because we're in this near, like near constant state of worship and dhikr of Allah. And Ramadans of the past have witnessed huge military successes for the Muslims, if we're talking specifically about that, including the Battle of Badr during the life of the Prophet wasallam. And it's also the time of the year when we make the most dua, right? And we make not just dua individually, but a lot of dua in congregation in Witr when we pray in the masjid, which is extremely powerful. And we need to remember that that is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal. So yeah, that reminder from my dad just made me look forward to Ramadan even more. And it made me realize that this month, it's not just going to be about me and my private spiritual development, but it's also, I have a responsibility to, the, to this ummah outside of Ramadan, but especially in Ramadan, I can't let it go to waste, inshallah. Yeah. No, for sure. I think that summarizes the way a lot of people are feeling where, you know, entering this month is normally a time of a lot of, of much celebration. And people almost feel like, how do we uh, celebrate under these circumstances? But ultimately, in our, if our celebration is bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving us more opportunities to help this ummah through appealing to him, and like you're saying, being engaged in all of this kind of ibadah, we definitely need to make use of that opportunity. Alhamdulillah. Um, I think it's also really interesting what you were saying about how the facade of the reality that we live under, particularly those of us who are residing in the West, has been kind of stripped away and I think that was again also something that was quite like shocking in the beginning where many of us are aware of this obviously that you know we are perhaps living in places where um you know the sentiments are not necessarily aligned to our own or we have uh governments that are obviously pursuing their own interests at the expense of the interests of the ummah in different countries around the world But it really got to another level when I was sort of like, you know, going to work, coming back, uh, operating in society as per usual, but wondering how many people that I'm seeing here are like backing genocide, are okay with what we are seeing on the television screens, while, you know, the rest of us are being internally sort of destroyed inside witnessing what we're seeing. I think that that itself also though in especially in the past uh sort of in the past two three months as the situation has just degenerated and got much much worse it's opened the eyes of many people purely because of how unbelievable the devastation is but how much western media and western governments have been willing to ignore uh and remain staunch in support for israel in the face of these facts uh, and if there are any, the, the the very, very few good things that have come out of this, one of which is definitely, I feel that the Western narrative has lost all and every piece of credibility amongst sane people, um, because it's undeniable that what we are seeing is, you know, savagery of a huge level, and yet it's not being even recognised enough to call for peace. The idea that these states were supposed to be peace-loving can't bring themselves to call for peace i think has been a wake-up call to many muslims and and non-muslims um who may have believed that illusion before yeah no and i think that's this is one of the things that what if you were to mention it before in a lot of social forums people would kind of you know they wouldn't like maybe outright disagree but they would kind of roll their eyes as like here she goes being like a radical (laughs) you know (laughs) anti the system type of we've all been that well we have yeah <laughs> yeah no and it, but now it's like anybody who still has not come to that realization it's like yeah you live under a rock and we're just going to move on but at the same time i think one of the like speaking of like facades that have kind of fallen away i think one of the biggest misconceptions that has been cleared up is that muslims have no agency and they have no ability to like make large scale changes mm-hmm. and it, that was achieved by like a one group of people in one part of one country, the Palestinian resistance alone has literally just made that facade fall away completely, that Muslims have no agency, that they can't um, affect change on a large scale until they all become perfect Muslims and they all unify as one global ummah. And until, until, until they they took that first step and were like, we're just going to start. We're just going to go ahead and, and do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do. Um, and so alhamdulillah, may Allah give them tawfiq and success. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that has been, yes, one of the, again, 
few good lessons that has been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us throughout um the course of these events and it's also in direct contrast with the absolute inaction of other arab and muslim countries um in response to this worsening of conditions the fact that this small group of people were able to completely alter the discourse in the world and yet these states are unable to extend even the smallest hand to the palestinians even in giving now like you know the most basic level of aid we see that our border is still closed because israel would prefer egypt keeps it that way the behavior of these countries is a greater betrayal in my estimation because as much as we can go as in the west and call on the us call on the uk to stop supporting israel that you know i understand why these people are their allies they're their political allies they're their ideological allies i don't truly expect that you know they are going to necessarily serve the uh, the go against the interests of Israel because i understand that they're allied to them in the first place what doesn't make any sense however is the fact that the shared bonds of the people in that region let alone the ummatic ties that bond muslim countries around the world more generally the fact that these ties exist and are so strong and should warrant some response and yet we've seen nothing and whilst i think you know there is a uh, sort of people can sometimes overestimate the power that some of these countries hold when sometimes people claim that oh xyz muslim country could free al aqsa tomorrow if they wanted to um and this kind of rhetoric you know i don't think that that's necessarily true but the idea that these countries are just okay to sit back and do nothing is completely unacceptable forget any minor military action which thus far again we see another small group of people a country that has you know extremely high levels of poverty and starvation because of uh, another war that has an and blockade that has imposed been imposed on it from Saudi Arabia but we've seen that Yemen is basically the only country that has the backbone to engage in some kind of action against Israel but okay forget even the minor military action like they're taking the fact that surrounding muslim countries have not even taken any action to suspend any kind of trade relations with israel the fact that half of them have still got their israeli ambassadors in the countries those that still have relations with them is outrageous you know there were initially concerns about oh what's going to happen to oil prices if saudi arabia or the gulf is going to respond to the uh to the war in restricting supply and obviously we have cases in history where when saudi arabia has done that it has wrecked you know the entire global economy there was zero response from that block these are the same gulf countries you know in terms of saudi and its allies that had no problem implementing an economic blockade on qatar in order to fulfill their own regional objectives and political interests but they cannot do anywhere near that when it's against a country that is murdering and genociding an entire group of people so close by you know why are we seeing countries like the uae hosting israeli president isaac herzog on the sidelines of the climate summit that they had a couple of months ago and not even you know making an unequivocal demand for a ceasefire at the very least and by unequivocal demand i mean like having a meeting that isn't just filled with sort of pleasantries and you know the 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 kind of way that states interact when they have good relations or formal ties this is what we got from this meeting these are are our friendly relations and the fact that the uae is persisting in that is something that i hope will gain greater recognition among muslims and will prompt many people who you know enjoy going to the emirates and definitely um in the case of uh going to dubai for for holidays that we start to basically see the broader uae project which is perhaps another whole episode uh in and of itself but we start to see that for what it is that you know dubai in particular as not some like ho- holiday destination but actually the pr front of the emirates that's aimed at securing its influence across the region and globally but that aside you know back to the palestinian issue even again closer to home i saw a video that a friend had sent the other day of uh queen rania of jordan in qatar speaking very passionately about how we cannot abandon uh you know the palestinian people we have to keep talking about it and encouraging everybody there to continue their activism about it and it's absolutely baffling to me that a political leader whose husband 
and you know son and all immediate family are in control of a military that borders Israel is coming to a forum about like technology and telling people that they need to still keep up their activism she is presiding over a country 70% of whom are originally Palestinian refugees that were expelled by Israel. She herself has Palestinian heritage. And yet she's also part of a country that's still responsible for allowing exports of food and basic supplies to Israel that is directly going to that military, allowing Israel to use their airspace. Why is what, what this cannot be acceptable that we allow these leaders and people like her to come into these spaces and not face some degree of accountability? And whilst they heavily restrict that in their own countries, people who do have the freedom to be able to make those critiques need to do so. You know, I heard a brother say the other day that a group of um, brothers and sisters who were going to Umrah and were departing via Amman to Saudi Arabia from Jordan by Royal Jordanian Airlines. As they're taking off in the plane and they're looking out of the window, they are seeing red skies and explosions over Gaza from their commercial flight. The entire plane was crying. The fact that this is something that's normal for us to witness and that what you're not going to criticize, we can't criticize the countries around that, the countries that you're in, where you, you can witness, that's how close they are, is just mind boggling at this point and as much as obviously a lot of the protests that we've been doing are directed towards yes the role biden has played and the role that other european countries are continuing to play in supporting israel we cannot let the this betrayal slip under the radar as well if we have the opportunity to call it out and criticize it yeah on this point of why is it that the leaders of muslim states are doing the things that they're doing or not doing the things that we wish they were doing a lot of people that I know keep saying this, like, I don't get why Sisi or Erdogan or anyone else isn't doing anything to help the Palestinians. I don't get why they're actually engaging in these harmful actions. And I keep having to remind them and remind myself that they're not helping because they don't want to. Not because they can't, not because they're scared. It's not in their interests. It goes against their political program to assist the Palestinians and to help them fight against the Israeli occupation. It's not in their interest as politicians and as heads of state of secular nation states to then transcend the borders of those nation states and try to make sacrifices for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I say this to, to, to say that I am glad that more Muslims are realizing that these political leaders don't represent the interests of the ummah, not in the slightest. And there are zero excuses at this point to be made for keeping them in power. There are no more excuses to be made for people who are saying things like, you know, politics is really complicated. You can't understand what's going on behind the scenes. This action that this political leader is doing right now or his silence on this or this scholar's support for this government, there's like some hikmah behind it that you just haven't seen the outcome of. There's no hikmah behind supporting genocide of your own Muslim brothers and sisters. There's no hikmah of after the Palestinian resistance, after seeing the help that they received from Yemen when they when they helped prevent supplies from being shipped to Israel, it, they thanked them. And then to see that in the follow-up to that, the UAE, Saudi, and Jordan circumvent that by shipping uh, supplies over land to Israel. There's no excuse for that. And there's no way to like, you know, think about the like botany wisdoms of why they could possibly be doing this or why a scholar has like a something to say to these leaders that could benefit them and that could make them be a little bit less harmful to the ummah at this point there's no there are no more excuses to be made for that and i hate that we had to that we had to learn it this way but the ummah is learning it the hard way that these leaders do not represent our interests this is not a failure of you know every single individual muslim for putting these people into power because we did not put them into power if we recall the the events of the pa of the past decade this is something that's taking place against our will and we need to take a lesson from the Palestinians and reclaim our will, reclaim our agency in order to raise leaders that do serve our interests. Absolutely. And that starts with discourse, right? It starts with us recognizing that we need more so that we are able to demand it. And inshallah, then working towards it materializing in the future. But if, you know, we just keep making excuses for people, like you're saying, and try to find reasonings or wisdoms as to why they might be taking this course of action then that's never even going to be a demand that we make of them we're allowing that bad behavior as it were to continue 
So it starts by us actually having the strength to criticize something for the sake of Allah and recognize where an evil needs to be condemned and good needs to be upheld. And then inshallah working towards the conditions that can make implementing that good necessary. And in relation to discourse, that's, I think, been a ray of hope for many people in seeing the sheer amount of people who have become aware of the situation in Gaza, but also just the Palestinian issue more generally. Support for Palestine is reaching, I think, probably the highest level that it ever has before. Um, I mean, it was already a popular cause in that it's pretty, it's been pretty well known, even if it was controversial, like compared to other conflicts around the world. But I think at the moment, what's been particularly reassuring for me is that in the face of so much denialism, seeing the size of protests around the world, the consistency of protests around the world, going to the protests and seeing people of all different backgrounds, including many, many thousands of Jewish people, protesting in support of the Palestinians has been extremely reassuring. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And this is something that we can we can measure, right? By looking at um, how often Palestine is being spoken about on social media, on television in a more positive light than it has been in the past few years. How many more people are posting themselves, but also sharing about the issue? How many more people are attending protests? The, just the sheer number of protests that are taking place, um, that have been taking place over months and months. This is something that we can measure quantitatively right but it's also something that i i kind of like saw firsthand when one of the protests that i went to in in san francisco if like this was a couple of months back but i i showed up and i was by myself so i just like found a group of girls who were on my age and i was like i just started talking to them and they were like hey you're by yourself do you want to stick with us so i was like yeah sure let me just walk with them and they weren't muslim but they were very nice and we were chatting here and there and i just I had this moment of realization where I was like, I've been going to protests for Palestine every single time um, Israel like increased the bombings on Gaza. I've been going to these in San Francisco since I was like seven years old, maybe, or I don't know. That's like the earliest I remember is like being seven, eight years old at these protests, at protests for Iraq. And it was always like mostly Muslims. A, you know, a mix of uh, different ethnicities, not just Arabs, but it was mostly Muslims. And it would be very noticeable when we saw non-Muslims and when we saw white people, when we saw a Jewish voice for peace there, we'd be like, oh, look, there's some non-Muslims here. This is so cool. And it, we were kind of like tokenizing them. We were like, dang, white people are coming out for Palestine. You know, it was something <laughs> noticeable at that at that time. And then this time I went and we were a minority. It was mostly non-Muslims. It was, I would say, yeah, like primarily Gen Z and millennials, but lots of older folks do from all different types of backgrounds. And that was, it was the most directly that I've witnessed the shift that has taken place in terms of support for Palestine. And kind of on the flip side of that, one thing that I've noticed, and I don't think that this is, I don't think, alhamdulillah, that we're inequipped to deal with this, which is that obviously a lot of the non-Muslims who are voicing support for Palestine are coming with their own ideologies and their own ideas about how we as Muslims should act and conduct ourselves in this situation and how we should even they even have suggestions for how Palestinians should plan the future of Palestine in light of their own ideas about social issues and gender and sexuality and all these things. Um, and I think in the past, we were a lot more vulnerable to just being desperate for allies. And so kind of like brushing these things to the side or even at, a lot of Muslims were like outrageous agreeing with them and being like, yeah, you know, we're all in this struggle together. We're all fighting against the same forms of oppression and we're, you know, our struggles are intersectional, all that type of rhetoric. But now I think Muslims are, at least this is what I hope, is that we are in a position of strength and that we remember that, yes, we'll accept the support. We'll accept the support insofar as it actually serves our ends. That's not calculated. It's not a bad intention. It reminds us of what our intentions actually are, which is improving the conditions of the ummah so that people on this earth can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we all return to him. I think that's important for us to keep in mind is that as the support for Palestine grows, we keep it centered on Islam. We keep it centered on the Muslim Ummah. And we never divert from that with the mindset of, you know, the ends justifying the means, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've really kind of got to the crux of what the issue is, where I think there's an emerging question of we're seeing mass support for Palestine. But has this mainstreaming led to its secularization? And to an extent, 
like yes I think that's true like you're saying in terms of the wide variety of people that now alhamdulillah feel sympathetic with this cause and that's you know not hugely problematic given that what we're seeing is a genocide that is happening against Palestinians you know generally those who are Muslim those who are Christian those who don't have any religion and genocide is quite literally you know a crime against humanity so in the face of that level of evil we are going to stand with other human beings regardless of what they believe to support to, 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 to stand against the indiscriminate killing of men women and children and the targeted killing of men women and children but you're right in that I think that when we are sometimes next to people who are used to seeing the world through a particular lens, through a secular lens or a purely kind of decolonial lens. And those who divide the world into sort of black and white can sometimes be uncomfortable when religion becomes too dominant in the narrative when they are not used to that because of the circumstances that they've come from. But the thing is, onlookers don't get to determine how Palestinians have to frame their struggle or the way in which they need to be in order to deserve sympathy. They don't have to be the right kind of secular victims to deserve compassion. There are people with their own culture, their own religion, their own aspirations for their future, which we are familiar with, despite not being Palestinian, because we share their faith. So support, if where it comes from people outside of that culture and that faith, cannot be conditional. To be genuine, it has to be that we don't want these people to die because human beings, innocent human beings who aspire for peace and freedom don't deserve to die. Not because they these human beings don't aspire for the kind of peace and freedom that we envisage to be correct, therefore we stand against them. This is exactly the kind of mindset that unfortunately leads to the sort of genocidal actions that we are witnessing today. But you're absolutely right in that I think we as a community need to recognise for our own selves that we are not in a vulnerable position right now where we just need to sort of unconditionally accept that allyship or accept those kinds of narratives. And that actually we are empowered twice. Once because we have the haqq, we have the truth and we know Allah is on our side. But secondly, that there is a lot more awareness now of the situation. I don't think we need to be... Uh, so desperate, like you're saying, for allies. And we can recognise that the allyship that we have with many groups of people is really related to this one issue, and in some cases needs to be limited to that. We can appreciate the broad-based support, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are willing to engage otherwise. And personally, I know we've spoken about this before, and you know it's something relevant to consider given that you said our next episode, inshallah, which is actually from last year, will be about Syria. But when but many people who are very vocal about Palestine are often extremely passionate about it because they see it as part of a broader imperial uh game that the great powers of the world are engaged in and whilst that's not entirely untrue obviously there are those geopolitical um that there is that geopolitical context to it seeing the world through purely that anti-imperial lens, that Cold War, capitalism versus communism era lens, as it were, can often lead many of those individuals to have much more problematic stances on issues such as Syria, on issues such as the Euro genocide, or anything to do with countries that they see as being against the US or uh, against Israel. And it's been really unfortunate to see some of these individuals welcomed into Muslim community spaces and on some occasions being given platforms to spread their outrageous you know propaganda and misinformation about issues like Syria and other Muslim countries and issues. If we uphold these people as reliable interlocutors it's going to be very difficult for I think the community at large to be able to distinguish between why this individual can be so correct about Israel and Palestine and really insightful on this but so wrong on another. I don't have a set answer to this but I think that we do need to rethink how we engage with people like this because obviously the whole point of allyship is not that necessarily you're agreeing with somebody on everything but at the same time as Muslims we cannot in good faith platform individuals or promote individuals who might be correct on some issues but very much manipulate the truth on other issues and 
when these issues are as serious as the blood of your Muslim brothers and sisters, you really need to think carefully about that. Okay, we can disagree perhaps with the way in which somebody sees, I don't know, something about religion or social rights or gender values or something because this is a political issue but if somebody is okay supporting your palace uh, uh, your brothers and sisters in palestine against oppression but is upholding or denying the same slaughter of your brothers and sisters in syria we don't get to like throw one under the bus for the sake of another um, and we need to find a way to be able to address that more concretely so, so like you're saying we aren't just behaving in a desperate manner at because, oh, look, this person agrees with us and also recognises that the Palestinians are under threat. We don't need to behave in that way anymore. Yeah, no, seeing the way that Essidists have used the Palestinian cause coming to the forefront as an opportunity, not just to advance their own views, but to also monetize it, has been one of the most disgusting things I've witnessed over the past few months. And I, we need to name those people and and like actively call them out whenever possible. Um, on social media that's like an, a direct plea to whoever is listening is do some background research on the person that you're retweeting especially if they have tons of followers especially if every few tweets they say hey guys they're trying to deplatform me uh you know donate to my patreon so i can continue to do this work this is some this is a script that people like Jan jackson hinkle have been using it's a script that somebody named muhammad safa who's like this really shady guy on twitter who i investigated only to discover that he has like some ties and like some projects that he did working for the syrian government and literally uses the same language as Jackson Hinkle in order to like every once in a while be like, hey guys, they're trying to get me off of this platform, donate to me here so that I can continue to do this work. And then insert, and it's such a, it, it, it just shows you that these aren't sincere people who made a mistake, you know, who are just don't understand Syria, who just, you know, happen to be on the wrong side of one issue. But the fact that they're pro-Palestine means that they're genuinely, that means that they're ultimately sincere and they just need some correcting. Like, no, these are people who are, a lot of them are white supremacists, people like Jackson Hinkle, and they literally use this as an opportunity to gain tons of followers by like copy pasting content from Palestinians by taking their videos and their photos. And instead of sharing them, they repost it as their own content. So they post it as like native content. I think that's a term for it because it gives them more, more followers and more retweets. And it literally, if they're monetizing their tweets or their social media posts elsewhere, it makes them money. Seeing all of that has just made me realize that we don't see being pro Assad as as bad as being a Zionist, and I think we should. And it's really difficult to talk about because Syrians have felt the betrayal at the same time that they are they're they've been advocating for their own cause for so long. Now they're devoting energy to they already were advocating for the Palestinian cause, but now they're amplifying it even more. And at the same time they're seeing that the Muslim Ummah has not cared about Syria for the past few years and they at this point are just they're showing their ignorance about this issue. When people point out that so-and-so is an Essidist, so-and-so should not be platformed, so-and-so should not be monetized, you shouldn't be following these people, you should block them so that in order to limit their reach, and a lot of people just, they just don't get why it's such a big deal. I hope that this will be a reminder to us to just be more critical about our sources and to be more intelligent about the way we use social media and about the way, about who we platform. And that saying something that's pro-Palestine doesn't just give you a green check to be invited to banquets, to be elected by Muslims um, into the MP positions. I know that there was like a huge stink about like George Galloway being elected recently. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. so funny because I, I I remember he used to come here when he like when I was a kid, he used to come and speak at Serious? events here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember seeing him like because we, we would see him on the news, right? And he would just say stuff that was like super, you know, like pro-Muslim, anti-Islamophobia. And it was at that time we were just like a white man, like and it's a white kefid is on our side. Right. So it was super exciting. And then like they would invite him to all these events and stuff. And then recently, obviously, I came to I became aware of the fact that he is an Essidist. And he obviously like all these ideologues, what's so what makes them so stupid more more so than even other ideologues is that they just have a preset package of positions that they all accept and take pro Assad, pro Russia, the Uyghur genocide isn't happening, pro Iran, and it, they don't critically think about any of these things, but they just, just take them all on wholesale and spread their propaganda that way. But my mom was like, oh, George Galloway got elected. And I was like, yeah, I told you he's an Essidist though. And she was like, yeah, you did say that. She was like, I don't get why. And it just didn't make sense to her. She was like, I don't understand the logic, the motivation behind being pro Assad. And then she saw his Uyghur genocide denial and she was like, wait a minute, something is really off. 
And that was the moment of realization for her that was like, okay, yeah, these aren't just sincere people who, alhamdulillah, they're pro-Muslim, they're pro-Palestine, they're anti-Islamophobia, but they have some weird positions. Like, no, these people are not sincere. They're not on our side. And we need to, like, we need to cleanse the community of them. We need to not plot from them because their support for Palestine and their, in fact, their lack of support for Palestine will not hurt the cause. We don't need these types of people in our cause. We need people who are sincere for the sake of Allah, inshallah, other people who are supporting without inserting their false ideas into the narrative. Because I do see a lot of people who are not Muslim, who have other false ideas, but who seem sincere. And I make dua for those people. Because even a, a lot of Israelis, a lot of Zionists were trying to use the fact that Muslims are anti-LGBT to be like, hey, leftists, hey, American college students, why are you pro-Palestine? They're anti-gay. And tons of queer folks were like, we don't care. <laughs> do you think we do you think we're going to stop supporting them because, you know, they're anti-trans or whatever? And seeing that made me realize that, of course, what these people are doing, what they're supporting, aside from being pro-Palestine, openly sinful, it's horrible. But people have potential to turn around and they have potential to come to see the truth. So I try to remember to make dua for these people to become Muslim because they do seem sincere. Yeah, it's it's so true. I mean, this is what I'm saying where like there are when we think about allyship, are we, we're not saying that we only are going to be allies with people who think exactly the same as us. But the thing is, there are red lines. And the red line is you can't just be upholding oppression of Muslim brothers and sisters in one place just because you say it's okay elsewhere. If somebody chooses to have different values to us, different beliefs, or is genuinely unaware, that's very different to being a propagandist on payroll with many of these people. And as for people like Jackson Hinkle, I want to know where they get their funding from. He is somebody who's very young. He's 24, 25 years old. He does not have a background in political science. He dropped out of university when he was studying it. And yet he seems to have a particular preference for Russia in issues to do with, you know, the Ukraine war and just more generally being very anti-American whilst also being classified as being part of the far right in the US. So there needs to be some more critical analysis done of who we're getting our information from. Just because now many people are aware of the biases within Western legacy media does not mean that automatically everything on social media or from self-professed experts is right. And this is going to be like a learning process, I think, for all of us as a society, particularly with the new challenges that technology and AI and all of these things are bringing in this age of information, how do we differentiate between truth and falsehood? But at the very least, we should be slow in us, in, in, in when we receive information, rather than reacting straight away, positively or negatively, trying to actually verify things and understand who is saying this and what could be the motivations. Like you said, just employing critical thinking. And that's gonna, that takes time. You know, it's not as convenient as feeling like, oh, this is a reliable news source. Obviously, we all have certain news sources or individuals who we feel are reliable. But I do think this is a skill all of us are gonna have to kind of hone and make more and more use of in these times of confusion. Absolutely. No, I think media literacy is really coming to the forefront as one of the things that we really need that we need to work on as individuals but also as a community because as you're saying it's more useful for us in the short and long term to learn how to critically analyze sources rather than just telling people watch this listen to this everything that person says is correct because that person is a human being they're going to make a mistake that platform is going to you know at some point it's going to fall back on its biases or whoever is funding it and that means that we need to be learn how to critically analyze each individual piece of information while at the same time connecting it back to the person who's conveying that information and seeing what potential biases are entering this. Um, but on the point of learning about the Palestinian cause, but also just how we consume information in general, one thing that I, I would just want to mention while we have the opportunity to talk about it here is that for us as a community, in order for us to become informed enough about these issues to affect change about them, we need to be educated about them in a way that social media is not going to educate us. Social media is not going to teach us about the history of Palestine and the creation of Israel in a way that actually, you know, it shows 
why did things happen the way they happened? Who were the key players? Why did things go this way? What are the different theories and explanations for why these things happened the way they did? How can we avoid it in the future? Do we have precedence for this in the past before the creation of Israel, maybe earlier in Islamic history or pre-Islamic history? In order to learn those things, which we need to learn in order to be effectors of change, we need to read. And we need to read longer, deeper, more complex works. And I know that that's not necessarily something that everybody is going to do full-time not everybody is going to start reaching researching this issue and not everybody needs to there, some people their their contribution to the cause is going to be in something else and their their time is going to be better spent contributing in a different way but there is a kind of a bare minimum level of education and literacy that we all need to have about the history of the the current issues that our ummah is facing and that involves reading books and this is why as the Qarween project we publish book lists it's because we believe that in order to be informed about an issue, you have to read about it. You have to read about it extensively. You can't read about it only through bite-sized pieces of information that are meant to, oftentimes meant to entertain you, meant to keep you hooked so that you can follow and retweet the person and help them you know, make money off of their platform. So I hope that we take the energy that a lot of people are getting from social media that's encouraging them to become informed about these issues. But I hope that we instead channel that energy towards more substantial methods of education, of gaining information, rather than Instagram carousels and Twitter threads that are written by God knows who and often don't cite any sources. Yeah, absolutely. I think your point about the history is very relevant because there's one question that keeps being asked is obviously about where do we go from here? What is the future of this issue? Um, many people are find it difficult to see a way out of this and they often point to sort of Israel's extreme right-wing government at the moment as the main obstacle to any kind of resolution. But there are also many people who believe, you know, that the two-state solution has some hope. Uh, some people say we need a, a one-state solution. These, these questions have been on the table for years, particularly this issue of a one state versus a two state solution. So we need to go back into the history. We need to even go back to sort of political thought in some ways to find the origin of these ideas and recognize the problems that it's posing in this particular region. At the sort of political level, both of them are difficult solutions. The two state solution, as it was presented in the past, is realistically never going to be accepted by the Israeli government because they have very openly stated that they want the entire land of that region and they're almost definitely never going to give back what they've already taken in illegal settlements. Even if the land that hasn't been directly uh, conquered and brought into the Israeli state was given sovereignty and recognized as a free Palestine, what you would be looking at is a state that isn't connected, but they don't share a land border. And part of the state that was allegedly offered to the Palestinians in the past, uh, one of the conditions that Israel put upon it was that it could never ever be militarized. So you're looking at a state that doesn't have its own, uh, its, its, abil its own ability to enforce security, basically. Then you're looking at a state which, on top of this very small area of land that it has been given, is not necessarily going to be empowered from a natural resource perspective or by virtue of a particular kind of trade advantage in anything because it is so small to be economically viable. That's the two-state solution. And not to mention that the two-state solution denies the right of return to Palestinians who were expelled exactly. from their homes and from their land that is currently being occupied. Uh, by Israel. Exactly. Right of return has been one of the key sticking points that the Palestinians, you know, need. You have millions of refugees, thousands of them just even hundreds of thousands on the border in Jordan and Lebanon, who, as we all know, have the keys to their homes or at least seek to return to a land that their ancestors were on for generations. If they are unable to do that, then what we're really looking at is a formalization of the occupation not actually any genuine liberation or freedom for the people living in those areas. So in lieu of the two-state solution, you frequently have people, often those sort of on the more progressive left side, talking about a one-state solution as the key to resolving this conflict, where there's one state that Arabs and Palestinians and Jews live alongside one another with equal rights. 
But this again is never going to be accepted by Israel because absorbing the number of Palestinians that are already, you know, in the in present in uh, in Palestine, let alone other refugees who would want the right for return, would essentially not make Israel a Jewish majority state anymore. And this is the whole conflict, actually, that Israel wants to be an ethno-nationalist Jewish state alongside being a secular democracy. This issue of Israel and Palestine is not just one of settler colonialism, but it actually also speaks to the inability of the nation-state model to accommodate for diversity. Israel wants to be a Jewish state, but obviously it cannot be one and be democratic because it's going to be, you know, giving people different it's not seeing everybody as one equal citizen. It's based on your religion or your race. And this is just an interesting thing to think about in terms of how the modern nation state system that we have today, which is fundamentally born out of the European historical experience, how applicable it really is to different parts of the world. In the past, in this same region, we see various empires existed in the past, obviously most recently the Ottoman Empire, which made no qualms about being an Islamic empire, but ultimately at the same time allowed religious and legal pluralism, so different communities were able to continue existing. And this is why the Middle East today is home to actually so much diversity, while in the era of nation-states, you have whole ethnic groups who have been left without a land, so to speak. And you often see sort of conflicts emerging out of that, not to get into sort of multiple political conflicts in this one episode, but the question of uh, the Kurds and Kurdistan, the fact that many Kurds in the region shared by Iraq, Turkey, Iran and parts of Syria feel that they don't have a homeland because that region was sort of carved up after colonialism and given away to sort of different nation states has caused sort of political problems in that area where they have resisted or believe that they are entitled to an ethnic homeland in that part of the world. Some of them, obviously, not everybody. So this question, then bringing it back to Israel and Palestine, is one that, in my opinion, will not have, will not find a clear resolution within the confines of the system, not only because of the Israeli government and the fact that there is no desire on the part of the government or the people for Palestinians to have any kind of self-determination or to be able to live in peace, but also because the system that we have isn't built to allow that in the first place. So I think what you've been talking about does bring up, it does speak to, I think, a shared sentiment amongst a lot of Muslims now, which is that it feels so hard to see into the future and just think about like, how are things going to change? How are things going to look a year from now, 10 years from now? There are some things that I think we can already start to see the effects of and see how they're snowballing. So what would you say, what changes are we seeing when it comes to the global balance of power? What changes have we already seen and how do you think that that's going to continue to play out? I mean, I think this entire situation is so incredibly volatile with so many different factors at play. It's really difficult to predict um, what's going to happen. But in terms of the sort of more broader political consequences. I think one that we've already mentioned and that will have repercussions in the future for sure is the fact that American and Western hypocrisy is on full display. And the way in which that has also exposed the failure of the international system. You had at the last UN Security Council meeting, the only person that is holding, the only country that is holding up any kind of action against Israel at this point is the United States. They are the only one who has vetoed a ceasefire resolution. Even the UK abstained at the last at the last vote. The fact that every other member of the Security Council is either backing or not or not obstructing a ceasefire. The fact that the ICJ has said the genocide is most likely happening. The fact that so many other war crimes are being committed and documented by international observers and are being seen by the world on their t on television screens the entire world actually is of a particular persuasion and yet one country and its government are the ones holding it up i don't think that anybody is going to be within that system or any onlookers are able to walk away believing that we do not live 
at a time of great, great inequality, at a time of not just hegemony, but imperialism, where America as the dominant empire is dictating its norms to the rest of the world without the illusion of any kind of consultation. It is just brazenly doing what it wants. And this might eventually provoke other global powers to step in and show that they believe they have some authority or try and restore hope in the fact that there are more players in this world than just the US. Um, While China has tended to remain sort of not very um, involved in the actual conflict itself beyond expressing support, there are rumours that it will take a stand for more forceful action potentially working its way towards some kind of direct action against Israel, along with other sort of bigger economies like Brazil, who have also expressed anger at the ongoing invasion. Uh, But we also don't know. Um, It's very difficult to sometimes tell what countries are willing to risk for a conflict that really only gives the moral high ground, right? It's otherwise not giving much economic or political gain for anybody who stands behind it um so Allah Alam as always I think that at the national level and I'm interested in hearing from you about the experience in the U.S. as well but in the West more generally has caused complete polarization almost overnight in society uh between those who are unable to start to sit still while this level of violence is enacted against a defense a largely defenseless population and between those who believe that well we know what they believe but the way in which this polarization is fracturing society i think we're also going to be seeing the implications of that in the uk the government is taking measures to really shut down freedom of speech by cracking down on peaceful protests that have seen hundreds of thousands of attendees over the past five months, hundreds of thousands at every single one. At our largest one, there was a million people in London at the national demonstration a couple of months back. The fact that these are consistently being portrayed as hate protests, as unsafe for Jews, as causing havoc, um, you know, on the streets of London to then declarations made by politicians that the UK is actually being controlled by Islamists and London is being controlled by Islamists. It's led to absolute craziness, quite frankly. But that rhetoric isn't going to go away. This issue has also become extremely significant with a general election coming up in the UK and also the US. So again, this is defining the future of these countries, years into the future, not just now, not just sort of public opinion at this point in time. So, I mean, all we can say is that nothing will be the same. But in terms of what that ex- the exact contours of that change looks like, We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, when thinking about this question, I realize that I am better at asking questions than answering them, hence my role in this podcast. But to speak to what you were mentioning about, um, you know, polarization in the United States with an election coming up, I think on the one hand, you do witness increased polarization on a political level. But at the same time, I remind myself that most people still don't know about the issue. Like if just numbers wise, most people are not thinking and talking about Palestine. But despite that, I think Palestine is going to have an impact on the election. Although well, Adam, like I'm not a political analyst, I'm just, you know, this is these are my own thoughts. Um, but because it's going to, I think a lot more people are going to be affected by this issue than they realize. And so it does give me hope in the fact that there is still so much more potential to spread awareness about this issue. Because there are a lot of, again, sincere people who don't know, who aren't following but who once they learn about it, you know, their their fitra tells them what the truth is. And at the same time, I, I tend to just think more about broader, longer term questions about, you know, you're talking about the UN and the role that it serves and the role that different countries play within that system. And I think this is a good opportunity for us as Muslims to ask those questions about what is the UN? When was this started? How, how did it get set up mm-hmm. this way? Why is this the Security Council? Where, where did the ICJ originate? Who typically does the ICJ try when they actually hold cases against different countries? And I think that these questions are important for us to ask because it's just assumed so often that international law is international law because we all just agree that these are good and right things that we should uphold. When that's the, Obviously, that's not the case. And I'm not saying that 
there that none of these are tools that we can use at the moment. But I think if we want to see a true shift in the global world order for the better, for justice, for all people, for the betterment of the Ummah, then we need to ask those broader questions and we need to realize, we need to stop taking those things for granted. And that goes back to what we were saying about how it's important to study the history, inshallah. With that, as we come to a close on this episode, I believe once we release this episode, Ramadan will have begun, inshallah. We ask Allah to allow us all to reach Ramadan and to make the most of it. Um, I guess the last thing that I want to say is that remember that dua is one of the most powerful tools at our disposal. I, I remember learning about, I forget if I mentioned this in a previous episode, but just about what the Prophet Wasallam did during battles in the Sira. What was the Prophet Wasallam's role in those battles? Obviously, his role was as commander, as leader, as general of the Muslim army. But what was he actually doing in those moments? Because sometimes, you know, these, these battles could go on for hours or for days and one of the most lucid images I have in my head of the Prophet Wasallam is of him while the battle is going on, actually being inside one of the tents, raising his hands above, far above his head and just repeating, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, Oh Allah, the one who is everlasting, ever living, and the one who sustains all things. And just repeating this for hours, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum. This was the Prophet Wasallam fighting a battle on behalf of the Ummah by using one of the most powerful tools at his disposal, which was calling upon the creator who controls the outcome of these events. So we should all keep that in mind that our du'as during this month count and the time that we waste during this month also counts. It counts against us, against us individually and against the ummah. So let's all just be very mindful of our time during this Ramadan and then also beyond it, inshallah. That's a really powerful reminder. And just to end... I'm just going to mention something that some friends of mine had a uh, like Ramadan preparatory session and these were some of the notes from it that subhanAllah just I felt really kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of how a lot of us would be feeling where we look at the state of not just Palestine but the Ummah more broadly today and very often I think that the feeling that consumes us more than anything else sometimes is that of guilt where we feel like, how are we in this particular situation, you know, alhamdulillah, not facing the oppression and the difficulties of our brothers and sisters when it could have been us. And yet, and, 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 and amidst that, it feels difficult to focus even on something like ibadah and bringing ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this month. But I was reminded that every Ramadan, that Muslims at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through, they were going through some new difficulty. Every year, there was a different political reality, there was a different social reality that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslim community had to deal with. But ultimately, he brought that into the deeper spiritual meaning of Ramadan as a preparation and an extremely testing time where people are getting closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and like you said, taking that beyond us, using the benefits and the opportunities and the power of this month to our advantage. So if anything, the context of this Ramadan is actually closer to how Rasulullah and the Sahaba lived their Ramadan. With that in mind, we can approach this Ramadan with a sense of urgency, but also without despairing and not feeling like we cannot enjoy parts of it, that we cannot use it not only to pray for the state of the Ummah, but also to sustain ourselves for the difficulties that all of us are going through in our own individual lives, the tests that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our own individual sakes as well as our communal sake. Islam is obviously about balance first and foremost and the Prophet sallallahu showed us how to have balance in everything that we do and this Ramadan is inshallah a chance for us to recapture that. It's Allah opening the doors of his mercy, making that easier. It's almost a reward after these five months of real intense pain that so many of us have been feeling and of course the people of Palestine as a gateway to our own individual success and inshallah our victory as an ummah overall. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be with the people of Palestine and the people of Sudan and Kashmir and East Turkestan and Burma, Muslims all around the world who will be experiencing another Ramadan. We pray that they will be under the, the shade of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this Ramadan and beyond it. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a swift end to their suffering. And we pray that he makes us tools for the mission of this ummah, for the cause of this ummah, and not against it or simply useless for the cause. With that, we will go ahead and close this episode. Um, we also ask everybody who's listening to keep the Qarawiyyin project and its team members in your du'as. Today, it's just me and Aisha, but the other sisters are still around. Um, they weren't able to make it today. But inshallah, you'll be hearing from them in future episodes and also seeing articles from them. And yeah, make du'a for us because we are going through a, a transitionary period of just you know figuring out who we are and what we want to do. So we hope that that leads to more beneficial work on our part and we hope that other people benefit from it. Jazakum Allah khairan for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.